Hello, everyone. I'm Sid Melcher, Executive Director of the World Affairs Council of Western Massachusetts. And I want to welcome you to our latest um, Instant Issues Online event with British Consul General Peter Abbott and Deputy Consul Mike, uh, excuse me, Tom Nichols. We also have World Affairs Council Vice President Don Creighton to moderate today. I want to begin by thanking our Instant Issues sponsors, Glenn Meadow, Sir Speedy, and Wilbraham and Munson Academy. We are also grateful to NAI Plotkin and um, 1350 Main Street LLC for office and uh, maybe in the not too distant future, again, event space. I'd also like to thank Jeremy Cole uh, of, our, of JD Cole TV, um, who will be putting video of this event up on our website and our YouTube channel in a few days and also mention that we will be uh, rebroadcasting the audio by uh, Valley Eye Radio, our partner who um, works with people who have print disabilities. Our next Instant Issues event will be on June 9th at noon when we will welcome uh, Dr. Abbott's colleague, Alberto Fierro Garza, Consul General from Mexico in Boston, who will speak on Mexico, USA, US Today, Neighbors, Partners, and Friends. Uh, you can find out more information about that and register on our website, and I will post links to that in the chat. Now I'm going to hand you over to our the capable hands of Dawn Creighton, who is our for, in her former life as Western Massachusetts Director of Associated Industries of Massachusetts, connected us with the UK Consulate of New England six years ago, and that has been a, a fruitful relationship ever since. So take it away, Dawn. Thank you so much, Sid. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Tom, for being here. I'm excited we have this opportunity to be able to have you both in Zoom land. I will say one of the things I miss about getting together live is in the past when we had the consulate come out, we, we actually went out to companies in Massachusetts. So it was an entire day of field trips and running around Springfield and showing off our fine city. So when we can all be together again, let's plan a day of field trips. We are pleased to have Dr. Peter Abbott here, who is the Council General with the British Consulate of New England. Dr. Peter Abbott has been a member of Her Majesty's diplomatic service for 15 years before becoming the British Council General to New England in 2020. He served as the counselor to British High Commission in Bazan, Pakistan, in operational oversight of the largest mission in the UK's overseas diplomatic network. Earlier in his career, Peter was the deputy head of mission and British embassy in Lisbon. Before posted in Portugal, Peter covered West Africa with a particular focus on the emerging threat of terrorism and instability in Mali and Sahar. Prior to this, he led the government's review of the UK counter radicalization strategy, prevent based in the office for the government's review, oh, excuse me, security and counterterrorism at the home office. This has followed a posting at the British Embassy in Washington, where he was a private secretary by the, by the ambassador, Sir Nigel Chuen from 28 to 2010. So as you can see, we have a wealth of information in the room. Next, we have Tom Nichols. Tom is the Deputy Consul General and Consulate General to New England. Tom Nicholas has been a member to Her Majesty's service for six years. Prior to becoming the Deputy Consulate General to New England in 2020, he served as the Assistant Director in Trade Profession Business Service in the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, where he took the negotiations from the UK-US Free Trade Agreement. Before joining the civil service, Tom was a deputy county, county, I knew I was going to trip over my tongue, I warned you, <laughs> deputy county director for the International NGO Acted in Pakistan, and previously worked for the same organization in Tajikistan. and I know I've mispronounced that, so please correct me. He focused on the design and implementation of humanitarian projects across the Central and South Asian region. This followed a brief spell as an English teacher at the University of Sudan. Welcome, we're so pleased to have both of you here. So our format today is we're each Tom and Peter will give a little overview and then we're gonna cover four topics. The primary topics are climate lessons learned. What is the UK's 10 point plan? We're gonna talk about trade and the focus on Brexit. 
We're going to talk about COVID and what is the UK's response. We're going to learn how the UK is supporting businesses going forward. We're going to have a little discussion on global Britain. And if time permits, we might even have the opportunity to have a discussion about yesterday's press conference with Secretary Anthony Blinken and the UK Foreign Secretary, Dominic Babb. Why don't we start off by, so what was it like starting this role, this amazing role in 2020 and bam, COVID hits. How, what was that like? Well, um, firstly, Dawn, thank you very much indeed uh, for that warm welcome and uh, to Sid uh, as well and to the whole of the, uh, the World Affairs Council in Western Massachusetts. Thank you very much indeed for having uh, Tom and I with you today. I'll be honest with you, Dawn, it's not quite what we expected. Um, uh, and uh, if you're a people person, uh, as Tom and I both are, I don't think you would be a diplomat if you weren't a people person. It's been very difficult doing our job uh, in the absence of actual <laughs> flesh and blood people. Um, but uh, we've been making the, making the best of it. Uh, and in fact, I think both of us have discovered that Zoom and Teams and WebEx and all of these different platforms actually make you a very efficient diplomat. Um, I don't think you're as effective uh, on the screen as you can be in person, but you can certainly be very efficient. Um, and uh, because we've we've become so reliant on doing things virtually, we've been able to run things called, we, we're calling virtual visits or pop-up consulates, where we take all of the different functions of the consulate from trade to investment, to political engagement, to climate, uh, to consular work. And we will go and visit a particular state over the course of a week and meet the governor and meet the different commissioners and meet the big British businesses that are invested there, and meet the universities, the research centers, all of that within a week. So we're able to do an awful lot of calls in a very compressed space of time. But I tell you, it's uh, not as much fun as going around Springfield with you, as I'm uh, sure my predecessors would say. <laughs> we'll make it happen. Thank you. Looking forward to it. There you go. Tom? I mean, yeah, broadly, I, I'd echo Peter's points there on the oddity of arriving uh, mid-pandemic. I, I think I arrived about a month and a half after Peter, so it's been it's been a fairly odd experience, and it's been uh, uh, I'm not going to say it's been uh, mitigated by the weather because it's been pretty cold, obviously, for the past four or five months. So, you know, getting getting a New England weather, uh, New England winter uh, as your as your welcoming is, is quite something and impressive, I might add. Um, but as Peter said, I think we're, we're starting to get under the skin of things like sort of in New England and in the different states. Um, you know, we've done these these pop ups, which obviously started in a virtual manner, slowly, bit by bit. We're going to be integrating more and more kind of in-person visits. And I think we're really just, you know, we're chomping at the bint to get started on that front. And there's only a certain amount of diplomacy that you can do virtually before, you know, you need that that physical contact, those, those little conversations on the side, which are perhaps not as easy through virtual means. Uh, but yes, I mean, very, very happy to be here. Well, we're happy to have you here. And I look forward to the day we get down in Springfield for some tours. All right, let's just dive right in. We already kind of started talking about COVID, but what can you share with us about what is the UK's response to COVID and how is the UK supporting businesses going forward? So I think, I mean, let's, uh, I mean, we can start with the, the specifics of, of what's been happening in the UK. I mean, I think it's probably fair to say that our experience uh, in the UK with, with COVID uh, was a little bit like the experience in Massachusetts. I think if, if I can, if I can make that comparison, I don't think uh, we, we handled the initial months of the outbreak particularly well. I think, uh, you know, our government, my government would, would probably agree with the assessment that there were some decisions that were taken uh, that in, with hindsight probably weren't, uh, weren't the best decisions. Um, we probably came out of our first and second lockdowns probably too quickly. Um, uh, but I think what we would say is that in terms of the vaccine rollout, the UK has for several months now been one of the most, if not the most, successful uh, large economy uh, at vaccinating uh, most of its population. So we have now given at least one vaccine shot to around half the UK adult population, which is a, a remarkable figure. And I think some of our scientists believe that 
along with the sort of the natural immunity that is built up from people catching the virus and developing the immunity to it, that probably means that we've reached something approximating uh, this this herd immunity phrase that uh, that you've heard bandied around. And you know that is enabling us to get out of our lockdown um, uh, more quickly than some of our some of our neighbours. It's been, meant we've been able to start reopening uh, non-essential shops. Um, uh, our pubs are back open again, which was uh, the cause for much jubilation on the streets of, uh, of British towns. Um, and families are able to, to see each other again. Um, and I think, you know, that has been down to, I think, both the sort of British, uh, British um, uh, you know, British people following the rules. Um, but it's also been down to this kind of unique uh, this unique vaccine portfolio that we've put together and we were able to purchase a large number of different vaccines quite early on due to the foresight of some of our uh, leading medical committees and government bodies. And so that has put us in a very, very strong position. Um, we're also building our domestic um, production capability. Uh, and this is one of the things that I think we can come on to talk about that, uh, you know, we need to be we're not safe unless everybody is safe. And I think that means that we not only have to invest in our domestic capability for producing vaccines, we also have to support the whole of the world uh, in having an equitable vaccine rollout. The UK is the largest uh, contributor to something called COVAX, uh, which is the international uh, UN-led mechanism for distributing the vaccine to uh, developing countries. We've invested... Uh, over half a billion pounds uh, in the COVAX facility, making us the largest single donor. Uh, and that will deliver a billion doses of the vaccine to 92 developing countries uh, by, the end of, by the end of this year. And that, I mean, we're seeing this in India uh, in, a, in, a, in a really, really dramatic way, but making sure that we can use our domestic advantage for the benefit of the much, of much wider global community, I think is, is, the, is the essential thing that we have learned in the last sort of few months of, of dealing with, with COVID. But Tom, did you want to say a few words about how we've helped support businesses? Yeah, I mean, it, it probably is worthwhile. I mean, I, I remember having, uh, so I was, at, I was working in the part of a business um, when this, um, when, when COVID obviously and the pandemic uh, started back in, what was it February, March of last year? And very quickly, there was this palpable sense of panic, I think, amongst the business community. And I was dealing with the, the UK services sector. So I remember having conversations with many of the, uh, you know, sort of the lead broadcasting agencies, advertisers, uh, legal firms, you know, management consultancy firms. And the message was, we almost, you know, the first three weeks of the pandemic was just kind of firefighting. Um, and then it was a question of cash flow. You know, very quickly it became practical concerns of, you know, what can the government do for us? Because, you know, we have these black holes that are sort of, op, you know, popping up. And, you know, I, I have to say that the UK government was extremely uh, responsive. I mean, our chancellor uh, initiated very, you know, sort of immediate steps to put in place the furlough scheme, which has obviously been one of the most active. So it's actually called the, the coronavirus job retention scheme which essentially is the government's way of, of supporting businesses and being able to make sure that they can furlough their staff during this period. And I think, like many people, we thought that was only going to extend until, uh, you know, September 2020. Uh, but that was when we were kind of in the sort of, I suppose now, fantasy land of it's all going to be done by then and we're going to be back to normal. Um, I remember it got to September just before I was going to come out to, to, to New England. And then I think there was a stark realisation that though there was a tapering off, for example, of the scheme, actually what was going to happen was the scheme was going to be extended. And lo and behold, it has been ex extended. And actually it's been extended until September 2021 now. Um, you know, overall, there have been a number of like loan disbursement schemes that the government kicked into gear straight away. I think we're talking about £407 billion in terms of the actual support that will have gone to businesses from the UK government over the period of 2020, 21, 22. I think that's right. Um, if you, if you put that, to put that into perspective, I think it's 17 to 20% of, of the UK GDP. So an enormous social disbursement, probably the largest we've seen since the war. I mean, it's just uh, astonishing. Um, but, it, you know, the, the view is it was necessary. You know, we had to try and react and be there for UK businesses. And luckily, what we're seeing, I think, is the emergence of recovery, you know, the beginnings of it. Um, and, and as Peter said, you know, that allied um, to our vaccination program means that actually the UK is probably in a, in a pretty good situation right now. We mentioned the pubs opening. And I know here in the, in the US, we're seeing 
we're having a hard time with hospitality workers going back to work between the fact they're receiving unemployment. They don't want to leave their children for a whole host of reasons. It's that's a particular industry we're seeing having a hard time getting back into the workforce. Are you experiencing that in the UK? So I think, I mean, for a start in the UK, what, what's been slightly different compared to your experience in Massachusetts is that British schools went back earlier than I think the Massachusetts schools did. Um, and so you didn't have that problem uh, that you've said that, you know, the hospitality industry workers are having here of not having any childcare uh, for their kids. I mean, a number of studies have come out in the UK to suggest that reopening schools was not going to be uh, the, 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 the sort of disastrous measure that many, many people predicted. And in fact, it's, it's been borne out. Uh, and I think that the positive effects, not just on uh, not just on the business community, on the hospitality industry, but also, frankly, on the educational attainment opportunities for children, uh, far outweigh the risk uh, that children might catch might catch COVID at school. Um, uh, we've seen, you know, in Massachusetts, I think some statistic I saw, fifty percent of of kids were off the rolls, off the off the attendance uh, registers at any one time in, in certain communities. And that means those kids have been have been left behind completely. So I think reopening the schools has those benefits, but it also supports industries like the hospitality industry and enables people to get back to work. All right. Ridiculous question, but I can't help but ask. So during COVID, we had a shortage of toilet paper. Yeah. We had a shortage of cut individually wrapped ketchup packages. Then we hit chicken. Now we're hitting chlorine. What does the UK run out of? <laughs> we ran really? out of toilet paper too. And I, I don't, I, it's, it's like, it's the thing that people panic most about. I mean, there was no connection between toilet paper and, and, and COVID, but it must be just what people live in mortal fear of, you know, reaching to the side and it's not there. <laughs> well, I'm relieved to know it wasn't just us then. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, we'll take this back on a serious note. Let's talk about climate. Let's talk about lessons learned and what is the UK's 10 top 10 point plan? So thank you for, for giving me the opportunity to talk about climate. Um, as, as Tom knows, I talk a lot about uh, climate change at the moment. Um, and that's largely because the UK is hosting COP26 uh, in November. COP26 is the, uh, the next major climate conference, the next opportunity for the world to reassess the commitments that countries made uh, at the Paris um, COP, the Paris conference uh, back in 2015, uh, and to reaffirm our commitment to bringing global warming back down uh, to, to, to manageable levels. And I think it's, uh, and we can come on to talk about global Britain in a second, but I think it's a, it's a fantastic opportunity for the UK to, to showcase our leadership in an area where we really, really have some very significant uh, positive stories to tell. The UK was the first country in the world ever to generate um, uh, ever to ever to use coal to generate electricity, and that was back in 1882. By 1950. 97% of all of our electricity in the UK uh, was generated by coal. In 2020, so that was 97% in 1950. In 2020, it's now 7% of our entire energy mix comes from coal. Uh, and back in August of last year, uh, wind energy contributed nearly 60% of our energy mix. So we really have come a remarkable way for an economy the size of the UK, it's the fifth or sixth largest economy in the world, population of 60, 65 million people, you know, to be able to have such a significant percentage of our energy mix come from renewable energy uh, is really significant. We have uh, the greatest amount of installed offshore wind capacity anywhere in the world. We will have the world's largest single offshore wind farm when the Dogger Bank wind farm is complete in a couple of years' time. Um, the, uh, the Prime Minister, you mentioned his 10 point, uh, the 10 point plan. Um, that is a commitment to slash our carbon emissions by 78% by 2035. And that will include things like international aviation and shipping emissions for the first time ever. So, really being as innovative, in, as, innovative as we possibly can in measuring the impact that we have as, a, as an economy uh, on, on the climate. Um, we're ending the sale of new petrol and diesel cars by 2030. 2030 is only nine years away. So, you know, to imagine a world with no petrol or diesel cars, new ones uh, in the UK is, is remarkable. We hope to power every single home in the UK by offshore wind uh, by 2030. The government is investing £12 billion in uh, what the Prime Minister calls green collar jobs. 
And by some estimate, every dollar that you spend uh, investing in the new uh, the new clean energies, you get somewhere in the region of between three and eight dollars in return. So I think one of the key messages from the Prime Minister's 10 point plan is that investing in renewable energy is not somehow a, a break on, on economic development or, or somehow a kind of a sort of a tax. It in fact generates uh, generates economic development and is far more sustainable than investing in in, in fossil fuel uh, industry. So I think you know we we have this great opportunity to talk to the rest of the world uh, about the UK's climate goals, and we've been doing a lot of that at the consulate here in New England. So I think there's real appetite uh, amongst virtually all of the six New England states that we cover here, and certainly in Massachusetts. Um, to develop these clean, renewable economies of the future. Uh, Governor Baker recently signed into law some of the most ambitious climate legislation in the country. Um, So that's been really, really encouraging. Vineyard Wind, uh, which when it comes online in a couple of years' time, we hope it will get get approval. And I think probably under this administration, it's more likely that it will. Um, Massachusetts will have America's first industrial scale offshore wind farm. So there's real, real, posi- real positive developments here in New England on climate. And we've, we've just been doing a lot of sort of public diplomacy and outreach around that in the context of, of COP26, which, as I said, we're hosting uh, in Glasgow in Scotland in, in November. Cam, was there anything you wanted to add? Sorry, unmuting, muting. No, no, not from my side. That was an excellent summary. Okay. All right. Next up, trade. Focus on Brexit. Who wants to lead that discussion? All right. Well, I'll kick off and then I'm going to hand over to Tom, uh, who is our who is our trade expert. Um, I mean, I'll start by talking about the sort of the general points of Brexit. I think, you know, it was a in some ways, I mean, Tom and I were talking about this, you know, a few a few moments ago before we before we sat down with you guys. In some ways, you know, Brexit is not done. Everyone thought sort of Brexit was done either on the 31st of January last year or on Christmas Eve, uh, uh, Christmas Eve, this, this just, just gone with the signing of the economic and, uh, uh, and, and trade partnership agreement. But I think it's not done. I mean, Brexit will continue to, 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 to be negotiated, I think, between the UK and the European Union over the years to come as we, as we kind of fine tune our, our future relationship. But it does certainly feel that in the UK, at any rate, we want to move on to talk about other things. And I hope we'll get a chance to talk about some of those other things today. For example, our uh, foreign and defence policy, we've talked about climate. Um, we'd like to talk about a bit about the G7, if that's OK. And yeah. uh, we've got a quite an ambitious um, programme for the G7. But I think Brexit, you know, it was a it was a very long, a very intense process. I'm sure all of your members uh, followed the ins and outs uh, of the negotiation over the four, five years uh, since the referendum. But separating from the EU, separating from the single market, separating from the customs union, um, it was always going to be complicated. Uh, and there was always going to be, you know, even those who were you know, passionate advocates of Brexit would always have to recognise that once you've left the single market, left the customs union, you are always going to have more friction uh, in the relationship. And we, we saw some of that earlier on this year. We, you know, we we heard from the fishing industry in the UK who was struggling to, to export uh, stocks of fish into the European Union. Uh, we saw that with um, online traders finding it difficult to, to fulfill Amazon orders and things in the UK where the suppliers were coming from the European Union. But by and large, I think over the last few months, that has started to, uh, to settle down. And I think we're reaching a point uh, where both of our economies are adjusting um, to the new reality. But it was a remarkable achievement, I think, signing uh, signing the deal. It was the first ever zero tariff, zero quota deal, the largest ever signed by either party. Nearly £700 billion uh, pounds worth of trade every year that protected the integrity of our internal market. It protected the place of Northern Ireland within that internal market. And we think, you know, sets the stage for a very, very deep and very involved relationship uh, going forwards between the UK and the EU, not just on financial and trade issues, uh, but more broadly. It was one of the first FTAs uh, ever to have included things like aviation and law enforcement, research and development, cooperation on health and cybersecurity uh, and things like that. So we, you know, far from being going it alone and being separate from the European Union, I think we will, as I said, have a very, very involved and deep relationship with our, with our closest neighbours. Um, 
Tom, do you want to say a word or two more on the on the specifics of the trade relationship? Um, yeah, I mean, does it make sense to kind of like um, move from almost the, the Brexit sort of EU angle into the kind of UK US FTA angle? I, I wonder if that also sort of helps out. Um, before, uh, oh, that's a gr- great transition. But before we do, we do have a question. So yeah. maybe we can in- incorporate this into sure. the following yeah. answers. How does the UK look at future trade relationships with the US under the Biden administration, considering that President Biden is following many of President Obama's policies? Under the Obama administration, the UK after Brexit was told by President Obama that the UK would not go to the head of the line in terms of future US-UK trade relations. Yeah, I mean, I think that's without wanting to rehash the entire history of Brexit, yep. because otherwise we could be here for the next, um, <laughs> for, for quite a long time. The abbreviated version. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, 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 I do remember that comment. I mean, back in 2016, it was, um, and it was, a, it was an extremely, it, it was a, 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 a very difficult period of time for the country. I mean, it polarized like sort of the dynamics. But I think, you know, as Peter said, you know, Four or five years on, I think most people kind of look back in this and go, right, we've left, we've left, and you know, we're now in this situation, and 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 it's a and it's a different relationship with the EU. Now, one of the aspects of obviously being outside the EU, and one of the reasons for leaving the EU was that actually it would bring back our ability, our competence um, to negotiate trade agreements with the rest of the world. Because of course, when you're a member of the EU, it's the European Commission who go and negotiate free trade agreements on your behalf because it is a single customs area and it's a single market. Um, so now the, the I mean, as of Jan uh, last year, the UK was in a formal position uh, to negotiate with its, uh, with its partners. Um, and so we kicked off, um, we actually kicked off UK-US negotiations fairly quickly. Now, obviously it was a slightly different administration, <laughs> um, but, um, you know, we, we made significant progress. You know, I was part of, like, so we had five rounds. I was actually part of four of those five rounds before arriving here. Um, I was involved on the trade and services side of things. Um, and there was, I mean, there was a huge amount of progress in a very short period of time. I think most trade negotiators looking at that would say to get to that position, it would normally take, you know, a year, two years down the line. Um, but across about, you know, 19 chapters of a normal FTA, uh, we actually had, you know, draft legal text in many cases. And we actually had, for example, some very innovative chapters as part of the um, as part of this uh, free trade agreement. We notably actually, you know, came to almost finalize a chapter on small and medium sized enterprises, which was very innovative. Uh, we we're also looking at a digital chapter. I mean, this is a bespoke deal, you know, mainly the FTA between the UK and the US, two economies that, you know, obviously work very closely together anyway. And actually just before that, you know, to paint the picture, I think we're each other's largest investors. You know, the bilateral investment across the Atlantic is something close to about a trillion US dollars. And every single day, you've got about 1.7 million Americans who go and work for, um, you know, uh, British companies in uh, the US and about 1.3, I believe, um, it, million UK citizens who go and work for US companies in the UK. So from our perspective, this makes political sense. It makes economic sense. You know, it's a win win. And indeed, you know, our, our analysis suggests that the US stands to benefit from this, you know, to the tune of about $10 billion a year in terms of, you know, it's, you know, an annual increase in GDP. So it feels like a no brainer. Um, now, we've, we've had this good pro- progress, as I said, it was under a different administration. So when it came to November of last year, yes, the entire direction, well, negotiations kind of were put on a, uh, let's call it a hiatus, and, and our direction was firmly tilted towards the elections. Um, you know, since then, really, it's about, you know, it's been about, and, and since the outcome of the elections, obviously, from, from our perspective, in terms of, you know, our colleagues in Washington, and our colleagues back in London, it's really getting a sense of like, where the Biden administration is going to go. Um, and so far, the mood music is is pretty good. You know, I think, yes, initially, there was this sort of feeling of, oh, you know, with it with the Biden administration, is there a total shift? 
I do we get back to this kind of dynamic of, you know, the Obama sort of comment of, you know, you're at the back of the line. I don't think that is the case. I think that was said at a very different time. And we're now five years down the line. So we have to be realistic. And the fact is, we are each other's closest partners. Um, and so, you know, this is clear in sort of, you know, Secretary of State Blinken's comments. We hear this from new USTR Catherine Tai. You know, she's been very honest. Um, and, you know, our chief negotiator, our Secretary of State for International Trade, Liz Truss, has indeed actually had conversations with Catherine Tai on uh, the free trade agreement and starting negotiations. Um, but, you know, it's good news. Catherine, you know, we know that USTR Tai has turned around and said, listen, I need time to review the current status. I need to review where we've got to in those negotiations, and then I'll get back to you. But in the meantime, we've got an open dialogue. We've got very close communication with our counterparts. So hopefully, you know, fingers crossed, we should get back to the negotiating table fairly soon. Now, on you know the timeline, I don't think we're, we're hamstrung. Either side is hamstrung by the top, by timelines. You know, there's no sort of like pressure in the sense of Brexit where things had to get done by a certain date. The emphasis is on making sure that this is a deal that is in the mutual interest of both the United States and the UK. Um, and that's a deal which is good across, you know, goods and services. And also, you know, touching on some of the stuff we've already spoken about in areas which are a bit, bit more innovative, you know, like our climate agenda, okay, like our, our labor, uh, you know, issues, you know, where do we want to go? What do we want to have in this FTA, which actually makes it uh, something which is very forward looking, very innovative, and speaks to, you know, the UK US relationship. I think also, I mean, that's a very good summary of the, of the UK-US free trade agreement, but I think also our departure from the European Union has freed us up to sign trading, trade agreements with virtually any other country in the rest of the world. Uh, and since we left the European Union, the UK has signed um, trade continuity agreements and trade agreements with over 60 other countries, which with the EU deal comes to something like £900 billion pounds worth uh, of trade uh, every year. So we signed an economic partnership agreement with Japan in October worth over £15 billion. Pounds. And you might have seen in the news today uh, that uh, the, my Prime Minister has agreed with Prime Minister Modi of uh, of India, uh, a whole set of new Indian investments in the UK, uh, totaling around uh, another billion pounds. So really, really significant trading relationships that we're building with countries around the world that we weren't able to do in quite the same way when we were part of the European Union. I got a question. I'm trying to figure out when, what order to do it. So it goes back to climate. So I'll ask that and then we'll go on to um, global Britain. Our Question is, how is Great Britain going to offset the downside of wind power in the future? The downside being a lack of wind at times. You mentioned that your wind farms will be able to supply the entire nation at some point, which is quite an achievement. So I think, um, I mean, there's a sort of two part question to this. Uh, you want to position your wind farms in places where you don't lack wind. And so that's the first thing to say, you know, you want to find places where you have a a high quality uh, wind and the North Sea uh, and other parts of the coast around the UK have a very high quality wind, um, as does the Gulf of Maine, actually. Uh, and so that's what one of the things that makes uh, New England, gives New England the potential to be the next um, global offshore wind hub, because you have a very high quality, not just of, of fast wind, but of consistent wind, uh, as we do in the UK. But there is always a question about storage, and that applies to any um, renewable energy source. It applies to solar, it applies to wave and uh, tidal energy, just as much it applies, as it applies to offshore wind. Um, and uh, the UK is one of the global leaders in hydrogen technology. Um, hydrogen is uh, it's a gas, um, and it can be used to store electricity. Um, and we're developing some very interesting technologies to use hydrogen to store uh, the electricity that you get from offshore wind. And this not only deals with the problem that your questioner uh, identified, which is about, you know, how you have electricity even on days when there isn't when there isn't wind, but it also solves the problem of transmitting the electricity from the turbine to the shore. So what happens uh, at the moment is you have basically a very long cable that connects the uh, the offshore wind farm to the to the to the grid to the um, uh, to the mainland and that uh, cable is expensive to lay uh, it is prone to disruption and damage and also critically it interrupts uh, other industries such as the fishing industry uh, so one of the big problems you have with offshore wind is that many communities don't like 
uh, the idea of these big turbines, particularly in the fishing industry. And when you have cables that are running um, from the turbines to the shore, it stops the, the different kinds of fishing vessels going across that area. But if you are able to convert the electricity that is created by the wind, convert that into hydrogen and then transport that hydrogen by boat, uh, to the to the mainland and turn it back into electricity on the mainland. You solve that problem of that expensive and um, uh, and fragile cable. Okay, thank you for answering Ken's question. Global Britain. So um, I think the term Global Britain has come in for a bit of a bit of stick. I mean, like the way you phrased the question, Dawn, um, uh, as to what it actually means. Uh, and I think I would be the first to say, and probably most British diplomats would be the first to say, that there wasn't ever a time when Britain wasn't global. Uh, I mean, we are, you know, like I said, the fifth or sixth largest economy in the world. We are a, a permanent member of the UN Security Council. Uh, we are the largest contributor to NATO uh, in Europe. Uh, we have one of the world's most formidable armed forces. Uh, our intelligence services are second almost to none. I think I like to say our diplomatic service is pretty good too. So we've always been able to project influence, whether that's in the UN uh, or, or, or through the Commonwealth or, or through other uh, through other fora. So, so Britain has always been, been global. Um, but I think, you know, what, what Brexit has done has enabled us, I think, to feel perhaps a bit more confident. Uh, it's reinforced, and I, this is one of the things that we hope to get, get across to our chairmanship of the G7 uh, uh, this year. The G7 is the, is the group of the seven most advanced economies in the world. What we're hoping to do is reinforce our reputation as a reliable steward of the international system. And this is one of the things that uh, Tony Blinken talked about in his press conference earlier today with, with my foreign secretary, Dom, Dominic Raab, uh, was looking back to the way that the UK had been so instrumental in forging the international architecture, the rules-based system in the wake of the, of the Second World War, and then again after the Cold War ended, uh, the UK being a reliable steward of that system, um, but also as a problem-solving and burden-sharing partner. Um, one of the things uh, you might have seen, or your members might have seen, that HMS Queen Elizabeth, who's the, uh, the, the, the first of a new class of aircraft carrier that we have just um, commissioned, uh, left on her maiden voyage last week. She's headed up to uh, do some exercises in Scotland at the head of the UK's new carrier strike group, um, and then doing a tour of the Indo-Pacific region with the United States and with the Dutch uh, navies. So HMS Queen Elizabeth is the most powerful and the largest ship the Royal Navy has ever uh, put to sea. And critically, it's the only aircraft carrier in the world that can take, um, uh, I'm gonna, I'm not, I don't have the right terminology here, but that can accept American planes. So it's going to be running these exercises with the US Air Force, with the US F-35 stealth jets, landing and taking off from our carrier. And there is, we are the only country in the world that can integrate so seamlessly uh, with the American Navy, but also with the US Armed Forces uh, more broadly. And that enables us to, as I said, project our influence and to be a force for good uh, around, uh, around the world. So that's, I think, one element of, of what we mean by uh, by by global Britain. I think it also means critically being able to be a much more nimble um, uh, advocate for human rights. So uh, in the last uh, six or seven months, we've established a new global human rights sanctions regime. And um, a couple of examples of where we've been able to use that, we were able to impose sanctions on the Belarusian regime. And we did that alongside Canada. Uh, the EU tried to put in place sanctions on the Belarusian regime, but they weren't able to pass them because some of their member states disagreed with those sanctions. Now, because we're outside the European Union, it enables us to be much more, much more nimble and to work with partners like Canada, as I said, to put those sanctions in place. It's also enabled us, I mean, this sort of global, global Britain picture that I'm trying to paint, it's also enabled us to offer visas to um, residents of Hong Kong uh, and a route to citizenship for up to 3 million people who have been affected by the Chinese-led violations of the handover agreement that was signed uh, in, in, uh, in uh, the 19, uh, 1990s. We've also been able to, again, working with Canada, um, banned imports uh, from China that have any links to forced labour. You, you, you've been following this, I'm sure, Dawn, that the Uyghur community are being forced into uh, labour camps. And we've been able to strengthen our Modern Slavery Act to prevent those imports. And that's rather at odds with the approach that the EU has taken towards China, which has been much more, uh, more favourable. 
And China has definitely been on the agenda of the G7 foreign ministers uh, meeting that took place in London, uh, as I said uh, today. So everything from trade to climate to to um, uh, to human rights, these are all sort of, I think, elements within that phrase, uh, global Britain, which I think, you know, you're probably right to, to raise an eyebrow at. Um, uh, but I think if you start to add together all of these things, it shows that we have this, we have these sort of you know, world leading um, assets that we can put to use alongside the US and alongside our partners to be really a force for good in the world. Just to add to that, I mean, I was talking there about rather about hard power. So, you know, our military influence or our sanctions regime. But we have, you know, uh, of the 10 uh, top 10 universities in the world, uh, anywhere from two to three of those are in, in the UK and the rest are in the US. In fact, frankly, most of them are here in, uh, here in Boston. Um, and, you know, it's not just it's not just that it's our cultural assets. It's our sport. It's our football. Uh, that's the, the real football. Um, it's our arts and culture. I mean, you look at um, so Netflix has just invested six billion pounds in the in the British sort of filmmaking economy because Bridgerton was their top grossing uh, uh, production of all time. Uh, and so Netflix just sees this huge, um, huge market in the UK, huge opportunity for for British television and British um, British kind of what we call soft power. Um, and I think those things, alongside the being a member of the UN Security Council, being this, you know, the largest European defence budget in NATO, all of those things are important to paint that kind of picture of global Britain. Do either one of you want to address the uh, press conference yesterday in a little more detail with Secretary Anthony Blinken and Dominic Bab? So I think, um, you know, I've, I've talked about some of the some of the things that they they talked about i think they talked about open societies defending open societies i think there will be a big focus uh between the uk and the us on promoting democracies um they talked a lot about protecting fundamental freedoms and tackling disinformation um and there was a really nice you know we i think this event was billed as talking about the special relationship um uh, tony blinken highlighted that this year is the 75th anniversary of the speech that winston churchill uh, gave in missouri where he talked about uh, really for the first time, put, putting flesh on the bones of this concept uh, of the special relationship. And Anthony Blinken, in that press conference, he referred to the UK and said, you know, the United States has no closer ally, no closer partner uh, than the United Kingdom. And I think we could see that across from Iran to Myanmar, from Libya to the Sahel, from China and Russia. You can see that along, on all of those foreign policy challenges for the US, the UK will always be there uh, with, with those shared values. Check and see if there's any more questions. I think there is a question. I think, funny enough, it's a football question, isn't it? Speaking of real football, what is happening with the new proposed league that seems to have gotten quite a bit of backlash? Um, well, I'm, I'm pleased to say it looks like nothing is happening uh, with the European Super League. Um, it's, uh, it's collapsed quite spectacularly within about two to three days uh, of being launched. Um, uh, I have to speak, you know, somewhat carefully because I know that uh, that one of the owners of one of the clubs uh, it lives not too far from uh, not too far from here I'm sure that the Henrys are not dialing into this conversation um, but it's no secret that uh, both my Prime Minister um, and even um, the Duke of Cambridge Prince William who is chairman of the Football Association in the UK uh, were both uh, very opposed to the idea as were the millions of football fans uh, in the UK and elsewhere in Europe um, and that's why you saw the four English clubs withdraw uh, so quickly from the from the scheme once once they realised the depth of of opposition. I mean, I, I think you know British sport and American sport are really quite different uh, in many ways. Um, the idea, you know, in America, you can have a baseball team or an American football team pick up and move to another city. I mean, that is that is almost unheard of. I mean, it's not almost unheard of; it's unheard of in the UK. I don't think it would happen. Um, so there is a there is much more of a of a of a grassroots of a sense of real identity in every English football team, even the really big ones that have supporters all around the world. And I think they feel their fans feel a fierce kind of loyalty to that way of uh, of playing sport that maybe was not really aligned, I think, with the <coughs> European Super League proposals. Yeah, I mean. I think you've got to understand like the way that football is actually structured in the UK and with a lot of these clubs, as, as Peter kind of touched upon, we're talking about a history that goes back 
probably about in some cases it could be as far as 140 150 years um, and they were built out of um, a combination of some of them like sort of built out of local schools but also local uh, working men's clubs um, so community like projects so I mean like you know that they hold they're very dear um, to the cities in which they were and the areas in which they were set up and they've existed for the last last century or so um, not only that it's based on a, a system you know our, our football system is based on um, a, a league system of, of of promotion and relegation which is kind of at the heart of what competitive football is for the UK and I'd say probably you know that also applies to much of much of Europe as well in terms of their league structures. Um, so you have you know four five leagues in in the in the UK going from very much the amateur right up to the the Premier League, which is obviously the top the top league and the top division. Um, so the danger, obviously, it, with this type of you know proposal is that you are that you are getting the top six clubs potentially sort of you know removing themselves from that system or sort of placing themselves in a different context. And that, that has, you know, that could have significant implications for the game elsewhere. And I think that's really where the response came from, you know, fans, uh, from, from politicians, from ex footballers, you know, it, it was strong, um, but it was, and it was, you know, felt it was an emotional reaction in as much as a kind of practical one, I suppose. The only thing I would add is also that there's, I think there's now a, a football led, a fan led review of football uh, which has just been um, uh, set up by the Department for Culture, Media and Sport in the United Kingdom. So that will look into the kind of governance around the game um, and, and you know, the structures around uh, English clubs. But that is not to say that we don't like, uh, uh, by the way, American sport. We love American sport, you know. <laughs> well, we will love it even more when we can go back and watch it live. Yes, yes, live. There we go. We do have an, another question, and then I want to make sure you guys have a minute to say whatever we neglected to ask you that you would like to share with us. Question is, the monarchy is facing a number of crises right now with Mexit, death of Prince Philip, and how long will the Queen reign? What impact will these crises have on the political and economic stability of the UK? So I think the first thing I would say is that I don't think those crises will have any impact on the economic or political stability uh, of the UK. Uh, I think the British monarchy is one of the, the world's uh, longest standing monarchies and it has survived worse crises, worse crises than, uh, than Meghan uh, and uh, Harry's interview with Oprah Winfrey. Um, I think, you know, it has to evolve. I mean, all, all monarchies all around the world have to evolve uh, to survive. And I think in, uh, you know, I, I had the, the pleasure of uh, meeting um, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge when they came to Pakistan a couple of years ago. And I think in those two, you will see uh, a very modern, um, uh, a very in touch couple uh, who will take the monarchy forwards into the far into the 21st century. So I think the, 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 the benefits of the monarchy far outweigh any of the sort of the sort of local difficulties that they're going through at the moment. I mean, the outpouring of support and, and condolences that I received, and I know my ambassador received in Washington on the, the death of uh, the Duke of Edinburgh, Edinburgh was extraordinary. I mean, you just, you know, just read about that man's life and the things that he did. I mean, it's just an extraordinary, he was an extraordinary man who lived an extraordinary life. And, and um, you know, I think the monarchy does give us I always say this to my American friends, you know, you guys got rid of the monarchy uh, for a reason, but you replaced it with a president uh, that often, you know, I think in a head of state, you need somebody who is not a politician. Every country needs someone who they believe embodies the ideals of that country that they can look up to and they can revere. Uh, and I think that is the particular genius of, of our constitutional monarchy in the UK, that we have a politically uh, appointed prime minister and we have a uh, a queen or a king potentially in our future as our head of state and I think that makes us a very stable uh, a very stable constitutional uh, constitutional monarchy we have another question that has come in we actually have two more that have come in thoughts on Scotland will the EU accept if it votes to leave the UK uh, there's always a question about the royal family and there's always a question about Scotland um, 
uh, will the, well, I mean, first things first, will Scotland leave the UK? So uh, it's not simply as simple, it's not as simple as Scotland voting to leave the UK. Um, it is within the Prime Minister's uh, right to permit uh, a referendum uh, on that subject. And there's lots of conversations going on at the moment. Um, we have local elections coming up, I think, on Thursday of this week, um, in which I think the Scottish National Party is slated uh, in the polls to do to do pretty well. I think that will put some more pressure on the, the question of whether there needs to be a second referendum, which, of course, those of you that followed this will remember Alex Salmond, who was the first minister back during that referendum. He said it was a once in a generation uh, vote, once in a lifetime vote. And that's what we thought. And I think that's what most Scots felt. And now suddenly, a few years later, we're back to the same referendum again. I mean, how, you know, how often is this, is this really going to happen? Um, so I think, you know, your first question, will Scotland vote to leave the United Kingdom? In fact, a, a poll that came out just yesterday uh, suggests that opposition towards uh, independence is increasing. And some people speculate that's down to COVID, um, you know, the ability of, of Scotland to, 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 to have access to the UK's um, vaccination programme may have been a, a factor in persuading some Scots they want to stay within the Union. Um, the question of whether the European Union would accept an independent Scotland, I mean, look, I, I don't know. Um, uh, all I do know is that uh, the Spanish, for example, uh, and there are, other, there are other countries that have, you know, sort of regional um, uh, independence movements, but the Spanish would be absolutely terrified of, of doing anything that would give oxygen to the Catalonians, um, uh, who might think that they could have a, a shot at independence as well. So I, I think it's quite a long way down the line, but I think the prospects of Scotland, I mean, all sorts of things have to happen. Scotland would have to, they'd have to accept the, um, they'd have to accept the euro, they would have to go through all sorts of structural changes to join the EU. So I think it's, um, it's really very far down the line. And the other thing is to, to not underestimate the administrative ties that exist between, you know, the United Kingdom and Scotland. It's a bit of a, a ridiculous situation to say UK and Scotland, because obviously Scotland is part of the UK. But those administrative ties across the borders, which are sort of 300 years old, are extensive, um, you know, and it's just it's a very difficult thing to conceive right at this moment. And in terms of the um, uh, Peter's point about, you know, the EU's approach, listen, we're not. EU diplomats. We're not members of the, of the Commission, but um, as Peter alluded to, I think there are a lot of you know EU member states who would look on this with a very in a very quixotic manner. Um, you know, Spain is one of them. Belgium itself, where at the heart of, would also look at it very, you know, with, with a with a very cautious eye. Um, you know, given the sort of fragmented nature of politics within Belgium, um, so it's a very difficult question. But you know sentiment is is that we had that vote that vote was a referendum it took place and you know that was a once in generation vote so we are running up against the clock and i'm a stickler for time but i have two questions and i will read them both to you and you guys can fight over who wants to answer it or if we if you want to say we're out of time <laughs> what is great britain doing to address racial inequality in its borders one question Two, I know you talked about this briefly, but Moscow and Beijing are becoming an ever-present power and, frankly, economic military power. What is Britain's response politically to this? Speaking of what Blinken said, how do you think the West re reassert itself in light of this? Well, your members really leave it to the last minute to, to, to lob in some serious questions, don't they? Right. Um, so I almost hated to read it. <laughs> I mean, I think on, you know, on, on, on the first question about racial, racial equality, I think, you know, like the United States, the UK has been going through a, a, you know, quite a soul searching period uh, on the way that we, we treat uh, ethnic minorities. Um, uh, I think by, by a number of measures, uh, I think we have come quite a long way in the last 20 or 30 years. There's no doubt there is a lot more, uh, a lot more that we can do. And again, it's not just racial and ethnic um, uh, equality, it's also gender equality. Um, and, uh, you know, there, we're taking it very seriously. And uh, it's, a, it's a sort of, it's a, it's a day to day part of the work that we do uh, as diplomats here in the United States and around the world uh, as well. It's really kind of mainstreamed, that approach to things is really mainstreamed into, uh, into everything we do uh, on a day to day basis. I think on 
on Russia and China. I mean, as I already pointed to, um, you know, the, 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 the Royal Navy is now far stronger than it has, has been in, I say, 40 or 50 years. We're making similar investments in our Air Force and our, uh, our, our Army. Um, but we're also making huge investments in our cybersecurity, both defensive cybersecurity and offensive cybersecurity. More and more of the wars that are going to be fought with the Russians in particular, but China as well, are going to be around access to information and uh, information and IT security. And the UK by one measure, in fact, by the, the Belfer Centre, which is at Harvard University, uh, estimated that the UK cybersecurity capability was probably third in the world. Um, so we're really, you know, very significant player uh, on, on that side of things. I think we still have the ability to put in place very serious sanctions. A lot of, you know, a lot of Russian money in particular uh, goes through the city of London. So we have some uh, we have some leverage there. Uh, I talked about some of the human rights sanctions that we've put in place to help uh, ban forced labour from the UK. And I think that has a significant impact. The UK is a very large economy, uh, very attractive to Chinese investors. Um, and so there are lots of levers that we can uh, we can pull to help um, to help uh, counterbalance the influence of, of Russia and China. But I see that Sid has turned her camera on, which must be the sign. It's the guillotine, <laughs> the guillotine coming down. That's the warning sign. Wow, the guillotine. That's that's new. Of um, course, it says her thank yous. Uh, Tom, Peter, I just really want to thank you so much for your time today. This was a fascinating discussion. I look forward to hosting you when you do come out to Springfield. We'll do our field trip. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Sid, the show's all yours now. Thank you, Dawn. I was, I was going to say thank you as well. And um, I'm look, Tom, did you want to say something? Or no, you... no, nothing. I was just saying it was a pleasure. Okay. Uh, so thank you both. And thank you, Don, for moderating. And I hope we see um, many of you or all of you back um, on on June 9th. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.